live from the FIA Barcelona Gran Via Conference Center in Barcelona, Spain. It's The Cube at HP Discover Barcelona 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, HP. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're bright eyed and ready to go for kind of the second half of day two here in theCUBE at HP Barcelona. Uh, this is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. We're, we're here to extract the sound from the noise, HP Barcelona in Spain, HP Discover. 2014. Our next guest is Cube alum, and always favorite to have on, David Scott, SVP General Manager of HP Storage. Um, and uh, David, welcome back again. And just want to say, you know, thanks to all your support with the Cube. This is our fifth year. You got you sponsored us originally, and we've been part of uh, the Cube legacy. And we really appreciate it. it's become a cult here at HP. <laughs> People love to get on, and thanks to you and your team. Uh, so appreciate that. Um, but here at the event, let's get back get it right into it. So storage is again featured on stage, real bright spot in HP, it has been since you, you pretty far and your team came in. But last night, you know, you can just see the community of storage. And with Converge systems, storage, that culture is starting to radiate out. You're starting to hear people say innovation. That startup mindset is kind of breeding in the groups. Yes. So give us a state of the state of the state of HP storage. How's it spreading? Obviously the convert stuff, you were doing a remote interview from, from stage. What's going on? Give us a quick update of here at HP uh, Discover 2014 in Europe. Yeah, sure, John. I, I think, first of all, a, a lot of credit has to go to Meg uh, personally because she is really focused on innovation and actually investing in R&D to, to make innovation reality. And, and uh, there's nothing worse than uh, acquiring a, a company and, and then not actually investing in that company to make the most of it. And that's not a mistake that HP has made over the last few years. Certainly, you know, in our entire HP Converged Storage portfolio, uh, there has been a lot of additional R&D investment. And we've seen the fruits of that uh, coming out this week at Discover in our announcements around Converged Flash Arrays, you know, innovative flat backup schemes to make it really simple to back up your, your storage devices, uh, in our moves in software-defined storage and hyper-converged appliances to kind of fend off the challenges of the Nutanixes and simplicities of the world. And, and, and that investment is not just in storage, it's also in converged systems. And we're seeing you know, a really integrated uh, approach that is making the whole idea of converged infrastructure solutions a reality for the new style of IT. So where do you see the performance and simplicity equation intersecting? Because you know, there's all kinds of under the hood stuff that we can get into, I'm sure Dave's going to ask some pointed questions on. But I want to get more to the up high level message, which is, you know, converge sounds like a great story. Simplify things and you know, create this new DevOps-like environment in companies, whether it's enterprise or large scale. But how do you take something complex and make it simpler and still drive performance? Because at the end of the day, the environments are changing out there in the enterprise. Well, I think there are fundamentally two strategies that have been put forward in the industry today. One strategy is to say, the software-defined data center, all you have to do is introduce a control plane and that control plane can handle the underlying complexity of different types of storage architecture, et cetera. Uh, and that's uh, you know, the, the philosophy of a lot of the, the major vendors in the industry. Uh, it sounds like easy. EMC, it sounds really easy, right? But we don't believe that hiding complexity <laughs> is the same as delivering simplicity. And we also believe that the only way to deliver a consistent and coherent data center architecture that's incredibly efficient is to not just have a software managed layer as a control plane, but also create simplicity underneath the covers, eliminate these fragmented silos. And that's why we've built HP Converged Storage on this concept of polymorphic storage architectures. You know, a single architecture for primary systems-based storage, a single architecture for software-defined storage, a single architecture for data protection services that span across both. And if you deliver simplicity at the uh, bottom layer, at the foundation, you get the data center efficiencies that people are looking for in the new style of IT. So does that basically sounds like an operating system? You always want to decouple and make highly cohesive subsystems. Is that what you're essentially saying with that? Yeah, I, architecturally I, I, at least. I, I think one of the. Um, I think you're right. I, I think one of the. Um, uh, reasons why people can be resistant to the philosophy we put forward is that they say, 
but isn't it impossible to have a single architecture that can do mo so many things well? And, and the answer is, it's not impossible to do it if you have the right design approach in the beginning. So people often say to me, look, David, you can't really claim to be have three par as a flash of optimized architecture because it was designed at a time when hard disk drives, you know, were prevalent uh, and flash didn't even exist. Uh, and the, that's a true statement, at least. And yeah. it's a, it's a true Technically statement. Technically, a true statement. But what it doesn't recognize is that we didn't buy build an architecture at three par for hard disk drives. We built a storage I/O processing engine where we were looking at all of the issues that are associated with uh, IO processing. How do you uh, make sure you parallelize uh, as much as you can? How do you avoid the front-end contention from the back-end contention that is the bane of most storage systems designs? Uh, how do you deliver uh, efficiency without compromising performance? And if you build a storage IO architecture that achieves all of those objectives, fundamentally, it doesn't matter what the backing store capacity is. Uh, and that's why we've been able to move from hard disk drives to flash uh, and flash optimized solutions. And we'll be able to move to you know, non-volatile So that's the extensible architecture. So it's, it's, it's because a bunch of server guys built it. But, hey, that, but that's <laughs> I'm serious. exactly If the storage reason. guys built it, they never would have come up with the that storage solution. guys built, would have built a hard <laughs> disk drive yep. based array. And yep. we bought, built a storage IO engine. Uh, and by the way, those techniques, I'm pleased to say, uh, uh, also similar techniques that happened uh, through our store virtual software defined storage, because it was another innovative company, Left Hand Networks, that um, turned around and designed that architecture, and they pioneered software defined storage back in 2007. They had the first virtual storage appliance in the market for VMware, you know, what is now six, seven years ago. Um, with the foresight and the vision of how software-defined storage would evolve over time to leverage industry standard servers and be hypervisor agnostic and offer a different model, the ability to run compute applications as well as storage on the same platform. And so now we have a, you know, a second uh, polymorphic architecture, but in the software-defined storage space that again has unique capability in the you can, industry. You can understand why people were, were skeptical. Um, you didn't buy, go out and buy a, 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 an all flash array company, like some of your competitors said, EMC did, IBM did, um, you did not, uh, but you didn't have the money to buy at the time. Meg said, we're not doing big acquisitions or any acquisitions really until we pay down the debt. So you sort of were forced to do that. So people, I was a skeptic, I said, all right, well, and then people were using your, your marketing term of bolt on, because everybody was bolting on you know, virtualized storage, thin provisioning onto their legacy system. Yes. So they were using the marketing judo move against you. Yes. You just smiled and said, okay, stay tuned. And now then you come up with the product. And even still, there, there are skeptics. I'm still watching. But today we got a proof point. Lee Pedlow came on yeah. uh, from Sony. You interviewed him yesterday. Uh, took your all flash array, popped out a symmetric, uh, VMAX. VMAX, um, yes. Didn't go with Extreme I/O or other, not an, not an all HP shop. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a proof point. Obviously, want to see more, um, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, you got to be pleased. Well, uh, ever since we announced um, uh, 7450 or Flash Array, particularly with the new uh, Fin deduplication software, our sales have absolutely gone through the roof uh, uh, with that technology because we solved three problems that stopped all flash optimized arrays getting into the mainstream. One was the cost point, the second was enterprise scalability, and the third was enterprise resilience. The stack. one resilience. Right. And, and we were able to bring all of that together as an alternative to traditional hybrid storage arrays like EMC VMAX. And now we're making it incredibly easy for people, rather than moving from VMAX to VMAX 3, going through, you know, being the last people to move to the legacy architectures for traditional data centers. They have an easier move to a three-part converged flash array using our online import technology for minimally disruptive data migration. And they can position themselves well for the new style of IT. The interesting thing that we learned from our discussion in June was you used a term called escape velocity. 
And I, I'm always fascinated by these waves and the virtualization wave. And the, we saw some great exits. You guys obviously participated in that, along with many others. Compellent and Isilon and on and on and on. Data domain, in, in a sense. And you said that you didn't think that the all-flash array, the pure place, would be able to achieve escape velocity. Yes. Um, because yourselves and your major competitors all have solutions. Do you still feel that way? Do you feel like your competitors' solutions will eventually, or are there, or will get there, and, and, and that'll make it tough for these pure plays? I, I, you know, my, my contention was, if you're a startup, you really need a four-year kind of period to, to reach escape velocity where you have a significant architectural advantage. And uh, for most of these flash array startup companies, two years was it. And I say, was it? It's passed. Uh, we have now caught up, exceeded in critical segment areas uh, the all flash startups with three fast also converge flash arrays and all flash optimized solutions. Uh, and once you catch up architecturally uh, with a, a pure play startup, they have nowhere to go. Uh, they'll continue to have kind of momentum. Uh, they'll have an aggressive sales force who's you know, focused on you know, living or dying, putting food on the tables based on whether they can sell. But for the mainstream use cases and for the big market opportunities, uh, I think uh, 3PAR now is probably positioned better than any other company, uh, sorry, HP with 3PAR is now positioned better than any other company uh, in the in industry to win in the all flash optimized market. And with the amount of money that's been, this is something you know a lot about, with the amount of money that's been, been raised, which dwarfs what you had to do, sure. which at the time you said was a massive amount of yeah. money, and remember you I, I, I remember. I, I remember now considering myself cheap at 183 yeah. million dollars right. versus 500 and, million dollars. Yet the so investor, the board, and the investors were, were far south of that. And you said, yeah. "Guys, forget it. It won't yeah. work. I'm not interested unless you really are committed to this thing." And now the, the valuations dwarf what you saw. So the only option is public markets. Yes. Um, so we're going to see that. Presumably, it's going to happen soon. But you know what that's like yeah. as a small pure play. It's a, it's very very challenging. Life changes when you go public. It, it's it's going to be interesting because you you have examples out there of uh, kind of uh, pure play startups that have just gone public. If you take Nimble as an example, uh, and and one of the challenges we're going to see whether they can execute it effectively is big investment uh, that they're putting forward to try and grow the top line as fast as they can, but the bottom line continues to you know drop uh, dramatically and making that corner turn as a public company is going to be very, very painful, and it's going to be interesting to see if uh, if newly public companies like Nimble can do it. Yeah, well, I mean, again, you saw this with 3PAR when you were a public company, that any free cash flow had to go back into building out the channel and building right. international sales and so forth, and then if a company buys one of your pure play competitors, all of a sudden your distribution advantage just went poof, because HP's true. got a massive, or IBM, or, yes. or, or EMC, or whomever. Yeah. So it's going to be really interesting to to see. So what is the state of the storage business? I mean, is it just the rich are going to keep getting richer? Or is there? No, I, I think the da dynamic, if you remember two years ago at Discover, we introduced the uh, 3PAR 7000 series. You know, this yeah. mid-range platform, but with kind of tier one mission critical availability and resilience, um, but priced uh, at a, a point that anybody could afford. Uh, and when we introduced it, one of the things that, that we put forward was we thought it would have a significant impact on the high-end storage market. If you now look back from two years forward at what has happened over the last couple of years, you've seen the high-end storage market collapse. You see it in the data that IDC is constantly putting forward. And I think the, the fact that 3PAR uh, 7000 series came out from HP has really been a major contributor to the collapse of the high-end market into the mid-range. Uh, and that change is, I think, going to continue to, to go on for some time. And it benefits HP because uh, out of all of the major vendors, uh, in the last three reported quarters, we are the only major vendor to grow our market share in the external disk market, and particularly in the combination of the mid-range and high-end segments. Uh, and that's because we started this disruption of the high-end market, and it plays right into the strength of uh, HP's 3 pop product. Yeah, Calvin uh, Zito wrote an interesting piece on that. We were at Dell World, and he was you know, squinting through the numbers, let's just put it that way, and it was, it was quite, quite telling. 
Okay, so, but that's interesting what you're saying, because everybody always thought, me included, that the all-flash arrays would eat into that tier one. Yes. You're pointing to a different, now when HP acquired you and Dell wanted to acquire you, one of the areas of interest was that architecture could go from span a lot of price ranges, and that's, that's what's right. happened, you've driven that down. That's right. So and, and, and we, you know, think that there's an opportunity to continue to do that over time, and, and uh, continue to expand the converged flash array phenomenon, uh, bring it to new customer opportunities, open up new uh, kind of market well, segments. Well, as you build these personas in for block and file and object into three par, that starts to get interesting. And, and you know, NetApp obviously has a lot of has had a lot of success with its single platform, but even it it, it hit its limits. Obviously, yes. they had to go buy a Genio, they had trouble scaling, flushed it on tap, all They've that. They've taken stuff. on the EMC strategy. If you think about it, they have. Seven mode, they have cluster mode, they have Ingenio, they've got a new Mars operating system. They're becoming a, as much of a fragmented complexity kind of storage architecture as EMC has. And they used to be the single architecture. Well, guys. but I mean, you know, it's all about TAM expansion, you know. right? And you, know, you have to have, but you see, have we, empathy we, for we your took a We took a different strategy, though. Our TAM expansion is the, is the introduction of file personas on the three par architecture, single architecture, but accessing a new $4.5 billion mid-range NAS tab. Well, this is kind of what I want to get to, is that, it, you know, NetApp kind of had it right until they ran out of market, right, and then, and then hit the ceiling. Do you think that 3PAR could become that, you know, to use a term, overuse term, that unified array that can actually span price, price bands, and what does that do to other parts of your portfolio? You know, I, at the end of the day, uh, as long as we have a single architecture that can meet more and more customers' needs and deliver the business outcomes that they're looking for, uh, if that allows us to continue to simplify our product offering, it's better for our customers, easier training, manageability, interoperability, replication for them. Uh, it's easier for our channel partners because they have less storage architectures to have to learn. Uh, and uh, it's easier for um, HP because we can focus all of our R&D and innovation and investment in, in a single architecture rather than lots of different architectures. Uh, and that's the reason why we're so focused on in each separate domain of storage having a single architecture that is our primary kind of go-for of architecture. For instance, for the new style of IT. So for a systems-based primary architecture, it's three-pass store serve. For software defined, it's store virtual. For data protection, it's store once. And that's really what our, our strategy is. Yeah, well that's the store virtual piece interesting. A lot of money flowing into that whole space. Mm -hmm. We call it service and we've quantified that. You guys had a big lead there. A lot of people coming into that that space now. Where do you think that can go? And how you know, I, can I, I, I think I think um, once again, we are incredibly well positioned in software defined because there's a tight linkage between software defined storage and hyper converged appliances. Um, what we are interested in doing is allowing people who want to build out a, an industry standard server based architecture where they can run compute and applications side by side with their storage services to be able to do that and scale either in a fixed manner with fixed compute and storage scaling building blocks, or in a flexible manner where they can grow either compute separately or storage separately. Because one of the big problems about converged infrastructure solutions, and particularly hyper-converged appliances, is not all workloads scale exactly in the building blocks of compute and storage ratios well, that come. Right? Uh, normally, yeah. what happens is you end up with too much compute or too much kind of storage, uh, and the efficiency of the data center breaks down. So having a single architecture that can span from a hyper-converged uh, appliance like our CS200 HC Store Virtual through to a VSA-based approach which can run on anybody's hardware, you know, Lenovo, Cisco, Dell, HP, uh, anybody's hypervisor, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, VMware, KVM, or scale out with our Store Virtual 4000 appliances or be integrated into Helion OpenStack as, as our store virtual software is, but have the same data services. You can build a complete data center architecture, consistent, coherent, elegant, very effectively managed under uh, environments like OpenStack and OneView. Uh, and that is something that is not available. If you buy Nutanix, you've just had a new silo. It's a hyper-converged appliance silo. You have no flexible scaling mechanism to do it. 
and yeah. that I think is the, the big advantage we will you offer. Gotta, you gotta get going, storage. but I want to ask you one final question before we cut it from the keynotes. Is um, you know, Dave mentioned you mentioned four years of escape velocity. A lot of the startup, we watch the startup community as kind of a barometer for the industry. What's your take on that? Being, you've been a bit of an entrepreneur, you had to make payroll, run down, put your credit card down. <laughs> you've been there, done that. We're seeing different versions of the of a dot com bubble kind of popping going on. What's different though, these are people actually making money. So you're seeing a different climate. I'm not saying it will be a bubble burst, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but unlike the dot com bubble, there are actually viable companies out there. But is there enough room in the market for all these startups and all these valuations? Do you see that um, kind of uh, getting you know, a little bit more frothy or less frothy? What do you see in the startup world? I, I think we're quite honestly on some of the extreme edge of valuations and the amount of money that's been ra raised in the private world. Um, to, to kind of raise in the storage environment over half a billion dollars and have kind of three billion dollar private valuations for a storage infrastructure company, uh, that's slightly frothy to me. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think agree. I think the, the trouble will be if if companies who have that kind of private valuations want to go into the public market where people are starting to look at them and eva evaluate uh, their, their valuations based on kind of normal public market uh, metrics. It's going to be a very, very it's difficult going to be a transition. Bed. I'll say it, it'll be a bloodbath. I, I, I think it will be a difficult transition. And, and, <laughs> well and, and quite, quite frankly, <laughs> there simply aren't enough acquirers left for all of these private companies to find private, you know, public company homes. So that's the, the big problem. When the music gonna... stops, if you're not sitting in a chair, um, then it's going to be difficult for a startup. That's exactly. Unless they have a revenue venture. So, that's the case. Uh, what's your advice to those startups? Start looking for a buyer now or generate revenue? We're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a break for the keynotes. David Scott here inside the queue. Always great to chat with you. Uh, thank, again, great, great support here in the queue. But more importantly, impressive performance on HP Storage. Congratulations. We'll be right back after this short break. This is the queue, live in Barcelona. We'll be right back.